Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the post-plague edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. It's a Valentine's Day special. I'm feeling better because I haven't seen a lot of modern wrestling this week, and the talk will be at a minimum, but still pointed as we go into this feeling better edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. I'm in a good mood, finally, for the first time in a couple weeks, and to join me in, in celebrating my recovery Oh, fuck it. He is that man that can walk a barbed wire fence 32,000 miles barefooted, eat steel wool like cake, sop lightning with bread, pick up Plymouth Rock, and catch nine pounds of buckshot in his bare hands. Ladies and gentlemen, your friend and mine, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. What a pleasure to be here once again. I don't know those lines that you just did. Is that Dream Machine stuff? What is that? That is, well, that's Dream Machine stuff, but it's a combination of Bo Diddley and Tom Boogaloo Shaft all jacked into... Uh, <laughs> Troy Graham on some pain pills on Saturday morning at channel five. <laughs> and that's why he was the greatest ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> I'm not on pain pills, but now I'm on different kinds of medicine. And I, I may be a little raspy today because it's finally working its way. You hear my head is clear. <sighs> See, but my, I'm a little croupy, but it's coming out because after we did the drive through this past week, which was on a normal day. It actually, we got it out on, we did the drive through on Sunday. It airs on Monday, right? <clears throat> so on Monday, I was finally, I said, I got to get to the post office. I've got to, you know, through snow and sleet and driving rain, as they say, to get these packages, the Cornets collectibles, customers need their shit. So Monday it's wet and it's rainy, but I bundle up and I go to the post office and I've got my wheelie dolly thing, right? That I can lean on in line because I'm dizzy standing in line. And Bree said I looked like death and she was actually, she was doing a passport. And so I was diverted over to Steven so I could lean over in the corner while he did all the packages and everything. Because he was like, you don't look too good. <laughs> and at that time, my official total for weight loss total for 11 days was 13 pounds. And I said, I, I got no energy. I, I take shit and the symptoms, some of the symptoms go away, but then the, the, the stuff I take makes other problems like not sleeping when I was on the meth or the Sudafed or whatever. And, you know, so I'm back and forth and I got no energy. I'm lethargic even. So anyway, we get all the stuff shipped off. I get back home. I said, I got to go to the urgent care. I just had, you know, no goddamn motivation, right? So Stace drives me over there and I go in to see the doctor and I mentioned that I'd been taking the Sudafed, try to clear money. He said, Oh, don't take that. And by the way, Donna, Donna DiGiacomo also emailed me after the fact saying, Oh shit, that shit will kill you with your blood pressure medicine. And uh, thanks Donna. Um, he said, don't take that shit because <laughs> my blood pressure was like 150 over 90 and I hadn't taken any of it in three days still. And he said, no, you don't have a cold. You don't have the flu. You got a sinus infection and, and you need these antibiotics and these steroids. So he gives me this shit and he gives me some cough stuff and the, the, the chest stuff. And oh God, that tastes like fucking cow piss in strawberries. I don't know how to explain it. <clears throat> but anyway, um, so I get home and I take that. And by Tuesday, I get up. And now I've got some energy and I take some more of them steroids. I'm like, fuck, I almost wanted to work out. But instead, I packed a lot of Cornette's collectibles. And boy, I knocked some shit out on Wednesday morning. I'll tell you that. Um, but anyway, so now I'm hungry. And Tuesday afternoon, middle of the afternoon, I got to go over to Home Run Burger and get a double bases loaded. You know, that's double bacon, fried egg, grilled onions, double cheese, double patty. With a giant Cajun fry, a fucking strawberry sh or a, a chocolate shake, and a goddamn Sprite. Then had dinner Tuesday night. Wednesday. Jesus, and you're worried about the Sudafed killing you. Wait a minute. Wednesday, I was so hungry. Wednesday morning after I went to the post office and shipped off another round of Cornette's collectibles. I went straight over to Wendy's and had a triple combo. Stuffed that down my neck. Came back and started doing some more orders. And then last, that was last night, Wednesday night, I had an, a large hometown pizza, the thin, thin crust Joe special with four of their giant meatballs and some garlic bread. So I, my appetite has definitely increased and I'm up about five pounds. So don't worry <laughs> about me wasting away. Are you still though under 
Because last time you said you were under the weight that you were when you started in the wrestling business. Are you still? I think I may be even now. Around about 195-ish. Because I wasn't really paying attention then. I didn't know it would be memorable years later. Um, but anyway, so I'm feeling better. And the head's cleared out and a few more days of the antibiotics and everything. And, and, and that does, since I already have mentioned it, lead into a little bit of the Cornets Collectibles update. And that if you have ordered up through Wednesday, February 12th, you're hearing this now on beautiful Valentine's Day, February 14th. That means your shit is either to you or in the mail. Except for a few of the stragglers, the stuff has been kicked back to me because you can give me your apartment number or you've emailed me that it's been a month now. In that case, your shit's lost. Unless you're international, some of them can be quirky. Um, so, and I'm going to be dealing with those fine folks that have emailed me asking where's their shit uh, over this weekend and we should be all caught up. So I appreciate your patience as I malingered on my deathbed. <clears throat> um, but anyway, uh, and real quick, before we go anywhere else, I got to say this, um, and I've been tweeting, you know, notices about this and pictures from Neil Shockett, but little Logan, the uh, beautiful little white Pomeranian that uh, our friend Neil Shockett has, it, it, it has been in bad health and been in the hospital over the week, and it looks like it's a, a malignant tumor. They're still maybe reading an ultrasound finally or whatever, but it doesn't look real good and there's not much they can do. So, you know, we've been keeping everybody updated on that. And I just wanted to mention at the top of the program, because Logan sent Harley Quinn a, 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 a gift box from Chewy for Christmas. And then Harley sent Logan back something. And Stacy, by the way, Neil is, is fixing something up on the internet or whatever for you as a present. <clears throat> but anyway, I uh, just wanted to, uh, you know, we're going to, and I've got to get with him, but we're going to make a donation from uh, Cornette's Collectibles to either the Humane Society or if he has a specific charity otherwise that Neil would like in, in you know, in Logan's honor and just such a cute little pup. So if, if you haven't patted your puppies today, pat your puppies, folks, I had to squeeze. Harley kissed me awake this morning, by the way. She's been feeling a little puny also, but she, you know, just for a day or so, but she nipped right back up. Uh, but, you know, pet your puppies. Have you petted Swami today? I've walked him about five times already today. And now he doesn't know where the fuck he is, is now, what you're saying, right? <laughs> he knows where he is. He's downstairs waiting for the mailman so he can bark at him. All righty. Well, one of the reasons I'm in, in a good mood today is because I have not watched any modern wrestling in the last... Well, it's definitely yesterday on the Wednesday night front. I didn't, I recorded it, didn't watch it. Cause I, I just, I wasn't in the fucking mood. Cause I've been down and down and out. I've which, been looking down in the mouth. Which is like a, sh a shame. Cause I actually think you probably would have enjoyed the AEW episode more than most of the other episodes you've seen of AEW. Wait, wait a minute. Could, no, I recorded it. And I would have zipped through or watched it this morning, but I, the first thing when I turn on the Twitter is that Scooby Doo and Jesus made a guest appearance, and I'm like, <laughs> "Well, fuck! All right, you never, just never mind. I'll watch it later." That wasn't on the show, thankfully, I could say because I didn't know about it until this morning. I'm thinking, "Well, the experience is going to be interesting today because AEW, by and large, there are still some issues with certain things. Had a really good episode with some really <laughs> good segments, and then I see a picture of Jesus." And Scooby-Doo, by, by the way, apparently Jesus is a belt mark. Who knew? But I see a picture of <laughs> Jesus and Scooby-Doo in the ring, and I go, oh, fuck, Jim's going to see this. And he's well, exactly. So you mean to tell me for once they do a show that I might have liked, but I see a picture of Scooby-Doo and Jesus in their fucking ring, and, and that runs, well, maybe there's a lesson learned there. That Because... I did see some people tweeting saying, well, it was off the, you know, the TV or whatever the fuck after the fact. And, and I was, what? It's still in a goddamn supposed major arena in a fucking major market at a major TV taping for supposedly a major company, and they just pull people in from the crowd dressed as Scooby and Jesus to to do whatever the fuck they did. <clears throat> well, it's just to send the fans home happy. Send a, Then put the baby face over in the last match and say thank you and play ease on down the road like they used to do back in the day at Rupp Arena. Get the fuck out of here. It's time to go. We got to clean this place up fuck 
they it, it, they can they can hit their foot from any angle. They are expert marksmen. <laughs> A show that I might have even liked, and 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 the the news coming out of it on Twitter is Scooby and Jesus was there. You know that's what these dumb fucks want. They just want silly shit. That's why I think so many of their fans are fucking crazy as a shit house rat showing up dressed like scooby well there you go let's make a deal these people come from all across america and they do they ain't all coming from that same town dressed as they are to play let's make a wrestler what the fuck so you didn't watch that uh i have to admit i did not watch nxt i have it on the dvr i don't know if i'm gonna watch it because after last week's show i was so i lost any enthusiasm i had for nxt i'll give it another shot but i just i did not want to watch it last night. Oh, you know, it, it, at at this point, you know, zip through it, and because it, it's like any show at 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 this point, zip through it to find the the people who know what they're doing, and and that takes about half an hour, and you can watch the two hour show now, on either side. Now on Monday, I watched, or maybe I should say, I made the mistake of watching some of Monday Night Raw. I had it on in the background, so when I saw something interesting happen, I would you know take mute off and listen in and find out what was going on. I sent you various clips via email from YouTube of segments from well, Monday Night Raw. Did you have a chance see, to see any of those? Here's here's the thing. And I guess what we're going to have to just talk about this on the drive through this weekend because you're browbeating me now like I'm unprepared. When I came in this with a good attitude so we could talk about some fun things and a few cretins along the way, you got to browbeat me because I'm not prepared. I haven't done my homework. Um... You sent me links of stuff that people wanted me to talk about from Raw. However, what I the feedback I heard from Raw was that Shayna Baszler, instead of making an impact somehow by, I don't know, defeating Becky Lynch in a controversial fashion or whatever the fuck, she fucking goes all walking dead on her and fucking sinks her teeth into her neck, bites a chunk out of her flesh, uh, walks around dripping blood, steals an ambulance. Or no, Becky Lynch Becky. steals an ambulance. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to explain. See, is it? Yeah. Drives herself to the fucking medical facility, I bet. I don't know, but I bet the words medical facility were used. Fucking... And then drives the same ambulance back and comes back and does a promo? Is This is what I'm led to believe happened. This is what happened. Shayna Baszler, you got to give the WWE credit for creativity. I thought they would have had her debut and give her a big push by making her a badass like she really is and like she's been effectively used in NXT. Instead, they've channeled Barnabas Collins. And now she's <laughs> doing some dark shadow shit on Monday Night Raw. I can't explain. It was so bizarre. Like, Isn't the whole this? is not the whole idea of having a legitimate former MMA fighter as a threat to have her do and be involved in legitimate shit? What is legitimate about biting her, the fucking girl's fucking jugular vein out on live television? What is believable about her? It, it, I know they're ch trying to channel Stone Cold. Well, Becky's the you know female Stone Cold. He stole an ambulance at this fucking point. The, the first thing one of these fucking whiny little bitch journalists, we're going to talk about some of them today. First thing they'll do is see if there was any goddamn police reports of stolen ambulances in the fucking metropolitan area and expose all of that. And then you can't even get the heat by fucking... Biting a woman's jugular vein out, that doesn't keep her off the rest of the fucking television show. She's got time to get fucking fixed up and make it back. And by the in way, in the she, same fucking car. She didn't even really bite the jugular. It wasn't like Nosferatu style. It was the back of the neck. Like the what? I, it was so bizarre. Well, fuck, you, you can hurt there's there, you can hurt your teeth back there. There's all kinds of fucking spinal shit going on, sharp bones. Why would you want to bite somebody the back of their fucking neck? You've never seen so much blood. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. Oh, it was so ridiculous. And then, by the way, if Becky Lynch recognizes that she needs medical attention, why wouldn't she let them drive her if she was going there anyway? Why well, steal, she, steal the ambulance to go to the place? They yeah, were what, about, what about just strong arm the ambulance driver into the, okay, put a compress on this or I'll break your fucking neck and you drive me to the goddamn. I, <sighs> It would have saved her having to fucking pump blood out of her fucking severed artery <laughs> while she stopped at all them stoplights because she couldn't figure out how to run the fucking siren. 
Maybe maybe she was an EMT in a previous fucking job. And these are your comments without watching it. When do you actually see it? Well, see, that's a, for people who might want to watch this shit. When they just hear shit like this went on, it's just well, fucking why? Why am I going to give them my attention and my time to try to fucking buy into this shit if they're going to? slap me in the face with it being stupid and phony straight off the bat. That's why I don't, you know, I will, I will watch your raw clips and I'll watch your, your star studded award-winning all the petite wrestling program. My, my star, the one that you're praising so much. And we'll talk about them on a drive through this week. So I can try to maintain myself in a halfway decent mood today. You know, now that I think about it, maybe part of the reason I enjoyed AEW so much was I did make the mistake of watching some Raw this week for the first time in <laughs> months. When you grade on the curve, or yeah. you, you know, or just it's what you're used to. When uh, anyway, there's a Britt Baker promo with Shivani. I cannot wait to hear what you think of it. I cannot wait. In a, good, right, in a good way, and I'm saying that in a good way. Actually, she's someone who I think in three weeks' time has shown a lot of improvement being natural as a heel on the mic and her and Shivani's interplay is a lot of fun. So I can't, okay, so, so actually they're getting it down. Actually, she's done the same interview three weeks in a row, but nobody's noticed. Cause she finally did it right. That was, that was an old line. I didn't make that up. Uh, who was it said, uh, God damn it. I can't remember, but somebody said, well, God damn, I've done the same finish through in this town three times in a row. And, and the other guy said, that's okay. Nobody will recognize it. It's the first time you did it right. <laughs> so anyway we'll talk about that uh, this weekend um i wanted to thank everybody for all of the the tweets lately also of uh you know because brian your your music to be a music expert and a former music guy your music knowledge has disappointed a lot of the members of the cult here of late and i and now not only did they tweet some flat and scrugs, but last week they did. Did you watch the Stanley Brothers or listen to the Stanley Brothers clip of Mountain Dew? I did. I prefer it's that tweet. actually to flat and scrugs. Well, see, here's the thing: the Stanley Brothers was more true to the original, and 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 also it was a little better vocally because flat and scrugs were just just taken off uh, there at Carnegie Hall. And then also they came along a little bit after Stanley's were part of the original fucking wave, but there's all kinds of different ways you can do these songs. But I, you know, I, I'm just trying to educate you because I couldn't believe somebody tweeted that also said, I can't believe I love it. When Cornette says, Oh, for fuck's sake, when you don't know something obvious, like what mountain Dew, obvious, obvious North of the Mason Dixon line. Oh, for heaven's sake. You didn't like the Ramones. You can't say anything about my music tastes or anything else. There's an old holler tree down road <laughs> piece from me where you put in a dollar or two. Then you go around the bend when you come back again. There's some good old Mountain Dew. My mother used to sing that to me when I was a kid. Did your mother not sing that to you? When you were a baby? No, it was more like Tommy James and the Shondells that I was hearing from. Oh, come on. You have a problem with Tommy James now? No, I just, I, I have a problem with any mother that would not pass on Mountain Dew down to, but you know, here's the problem. Here, the problem is, as you mentioned, it's a geographical thing because you people up there in New York and New Jersey and in the suburbs where the polo ponies roam free, you people don't have any music of your own up there. Because everybody know the only two, and I mentioned I saw the Ken Burns country music documentary, right? A multi-part, but especially the first couple of volumes where the the origin story was the the best to me. But there are only two legitimate, pure American forms of music: the blues and what came to be known as bluegrass, which was folk and later hillbilly. And on what opposite ends, fuck. On, well, it, 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 on it, that actually, if you want to, you can trace everything back to the blues, or you can trace everything back to folk slash hillbilly slash bluegrass, even rap, whatever the fuck. But it's not nothing was pure and uniquely American. Opposite ends of the state of Tennessee. I don't agree with that. In well, no, wait a minute. In Memphis and in Mississippi, you had the blues, which was the black folks' music, and at the opposite end of the state of Tennessee, in East Tennessee, Eastern Kentucky, and the Appalachians, Western Virginia, you had 
hillbilly which bluegrass kentucky which was the white folks music what about and you people up in new york don't have shit well we have plenty but what about jazz jazz comes from blues i don't know about that i think so which and there's there's elements uh, there's elements of not only the African tribal rhythms, but also, uh, it, well, look at the the jazz and the blues documentaries. Um, blues was predominantly American branched version of the music that came from Africa. And fucking hillbilly music was what came from the goddamn hillbillies, which, which were, you know, Scotch or Scottish and an ancestry fucking 400 years ago or English or whatever. But it, everything comes from one of those two. That's why I don't like <clears throat> modern country music because all the power, it's like the WWF. It's like the wrestling business. Once TV came along and the nudie suits and country music, you know, didn't become... It wasn't country music anymore. It was showbiz at that point. Yeah. The, the the origin stuff, the blues before they recorded it and fucking country music, hillbilly music before they recorded it was the pure stuff. You know what you should get? There's a good book I have. Let me see if I actually have the name of it behind me. Is it over here? Uh, don't see it on the front row of my bookshelf. There's a great book about Alan Lomax that you would probably really like because, you know, he was the guy who went all over the place, seeking out musicians that had never been on tape. Yes. That weren't recorded to get their stories, but also get their music on tape. You would probably really enjoy that book. Well, that's why we still have this and Mountain Dew. Um, it, you know, when mobile sound recording became a thing in what, the 20s, and especially Alan Lomax and, you know, some of the record companies that were forming were trying to go out and find new stuff. And they either went to Mississippi or they went to the hills, the Carter family in Virginia and recorded this shit as it existed, because that's the point I was going to make. My mom sang that to me when I was a kid, because that's what her grand, or her grand, my grandfather, her father, <clears throat> um, played it at home on the banjo, because he was the family radio. They didn't have a fucking radio. And my, my Aunt Lola used to say, you should have heard Dad play the banjo before he got the tips of his fingers cut off in that accident at the farm you know and then, <laughs> but she's i swear to god i mean you know everybody in the smoky mountain area will understand a story like that but um and she said he could still do a pretty good wildwood flower but not like the uh, you know the old days but and by the time that i knew my grandfather but he, I, he was he was like 75 when i was born right <clears throat> so he had slowed down quite a bit you know, by the time I knew him, but that's what that my mom was born, Mama Cornette, in 1933, in the middle of the Great Depression, in a rented farmhouse in Duck Run, Kentucky, which was had just qualified to get big enough to have a post office, which in those days was a window at the general store. In you know, that's how they got the mail. Um. 15 miles west of Corbin, Kentucky, where the, the fucking local gas station was run by a guy named Harlan Sanders, who was kind of a character, uh, and called himself a Kentucky colonel, but he made good chicken. And, you know, they didn't have, I don't remember how old she was, she said, when they got a radio, but she was old enough to remember when they got a radio, it was a big fucking deal, right? And there was no television, and to go along with the record player they didn't have because they couldn't afford it. And the fucking indoor plumbing they didn't have because they couldn't afford it. And I'm not sure that electricity was a constant every place that they lived when she was a kid. So the only way that these people back then had any entertainment whatsoever was to figure out, because you could buy a banjo and it'd last for 40 years for whatever price a banjo was or whatever, or a guitar. So they would figure out how to fucking keep themselves entertained. Can you honestly... <laughs> Corbin, Kentucky, and like 10 years ago, had a population of 7,500 and a metropolitan area of 20,000. Can you imagine how many people were in Corbin, Kentucky 80 or 90 fucking years ago when there wasn't even the, the, the state highway went from Knoxville to Lexington, Kentucky through Corbin. That's how Colonel Sanders had his gas station. Otherwise, there wasn't shit there. And they would rent like a place where her dad had enough acreage to have some chickens and grow 
some shit with the idea of eating and selling the rest to pay for the rent on the property and whatever the fuck else they needed. So that was pretty much it. So that's why everybody made music in those days. And they finally, they came down and recorded it. And that's where all that shit came from. <laughs> did, I tell you, did I tell you when Colonel Sanders got in a shootout? No. There, there actually, there was two gas stations, one on the North highway side of Corbin and one on the South side side highway of Corbin. Right. So Colonel Sanders suspected the other gas station operator of repainting his sign to direct people to their station instead of his off the highway. So Colonel Sanders and his guy went to see the fucking other gas station owner and his guy. And the other gas station owner's guy shot and wounded Colonel Sand. No, Colonel Sanders shot and wounded the other gas station's backup guy, but the other gas station guy shot and killed Colonel Sanders' backup guy. So at the same time, Colonel Sanders eliminated all of his competition because the guy that owned the, guy, the other gas station that killed Colonel Sanders' backup went to jail. So that was how things worked back then. That was in like 1936 or whatever. <clears throat> when about, my mom was three, by the way. I found the book on my shelf here. Alan Lomax, The Man Who Recorded the World, a biography by John Zwed. So check this book out if you're out there. All right. Anyway, you want to sing one? Sing one with me. Oh, they call it that good old Mountain Dew. Come on, everybody. Oh, they call it that <laughs> nobody. Oh, they call it. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Um, it, it, people have been asking also. It was all over Twitter. It went viral. And it, it was in, as enjoyable as the virus that I've had. Uh, the guy jumped off the fucking balcony of the mall. Has everybody seen this by now? I think so, <sighs> considering, and I'm hoping that you talking about this will stop it. So many people have sent this to me and you, because you're tagged on a lot of these, over and over and over again. And it's to the point where it's just, I really can't wait to hear Jib rip on these guys, so they're sending it. Well, but yeah, I think everyone's seen it because everyone has sent it to me. Well, you know, here's the thing. And it was um, this guy named, I don't know if it was, I don't have all the details of whose promotion it was, but I don't have all the details of whose promotion it was, but there's a guy named Lou Cox that was in this match, apparently with his son, his son's one that dove off the fucking roof. Uh, but there's a guy named Lou Cox that has a, a promotion down there in Louisiana. And he's been running for quite some time. He's contacted me. If I, you know, was ever down that way, whatever the fuck, I, I don't have anything bad to say about this guy. I've had, I've heard good things about him and his shows. Um, but this, and, and it like I said, it was his son that took the fucking plunge. And Jesus Christ, that's from either from looking up or looking down. It's obvious what this was, whether it was one of their promotions, they were a sold show at the mall. I don't know the circumstances, whether they were just working for somebody else, whatever. This was obviously not an attempt to make the people in the mall that came to the mall show happy, or even to make the people at the mall that may have paid for the mall show happy. This was an attempt to fucking have everybody go, holy shit, look at this on the internet is what it was obviously because nobody in their right mind <clears throat> as a businessman, OVW ran in uh, shows in public places at fairs and festivals with the, the local minor league ball team at the, you know, baseball field what does a mall want if they say, oh, we'd like to have a wrestling show and we'll put up X amount of dollars for this to happen? They want to draw a crowd in that will then go and shop at their stores. They want to entertain the kids and have something to put in their advertising to draw people again to the mall. Uh, they want people going out saying they were entertained. Wow, there was a good show and I'd like to come back. So what would happen if the fucking manager of the mall, somebody walks in his office and says, hey, one of those wrestlers just jumped off the second floor of our balcony and goddamn, he's dead. He is stone cold graveyard dead. Broke his fucking neck. Or he's broken his leg. The fucking bone is sticking out. Goddamn blood. The kids were are puking. They need counseling. We're, we've already heard about three lawsuits from... or So there was no thought to that. 
because this was literally the kid steps over the rail and does a crossbody from what was that 25 feet in the air give or take five either way yeah because i saw a second angle you know the one that you see from his level from the balcony oh that looks like 100 feet that looks like 100 feet but then when you see the one from the floor it's still you know impressive if that's your kind of well thing, yes but... we're not diminishing the height of the thing but we're just a legitimate 25 feet to dive into, if, if it's 25 feet up and the wrestling ring is about three or four feet off the fucking ground, you're flying 20 feet and there was three guys in the ring. I think apparently his partner and the two opponents, right? I think his partner was his dad. And they set up to provide some kind of base, but it didn't make sense for him to cross body his dad. So the two in the front were taking the most of it. His dad was just, his partner was just kind of holding him up there, supposedly. But when they hit the fucking, when he hit them, you get to boom, it's like, fuck. And they flattened out like fucking pancakes. And then, of course, then he rolled off, and then the clip ends. Did it win the match? Was that even the finish? I don't Nobody, know. I don't know who won. That's the, And that's one uh, another one of the points. Nobody cares who won. Because there's a wrestling match in a goddamn shopping mall. It, w- it, it was not an attempt to make the mall happy. Uh, it was an attempt to go viral. It was not an attempt to have a great fucking match or get a convincing victory over a you know team they've been feuding with because it might not even been a finish. It was so that everybody would say, look at this fucking guy. And I don't know what good there is in that necessarily. Well, it, he'll probably get booked. Somebody said, you know, when Sports Illustrated or .com or whatever retweeted it, the WWE ought to sign this guy up. I promise you, the one people that are probably never going to sign this guy up is the WWE. That's what, you know, now that I think about it, if they if these uh, alleged promoters will use the challenged fellow that falls on dangerous shit and, and the invisible man, they'll book this kid because he'll jump off the fucking roof. Because if you're booking a guy that jumped off the fucking roof and he comes to your town and you pay to see him, and he doesn't jump off the fucking roof again, what the fuck good is it? So this will get this kid booked and or paralyzed. Possibly both. Probably both, eventually, if it lasts long enough. Until the next fucking knucklehead, and I don't even mean to insert, but until just some fucking guy that just wants to get booked so bad he doesn't give a fuck whether he kills himself or not, does something even goddamn stupider or crazier or fucking bigger. And then they'll start booking him. And then the guy that jumped off the roof that got booked for six months until somebody jumped off a higher roof, won't get booked anymore. And he will have risked his life over and over to jump off these roofs and won't make a, a, unless, unless he starts jumping off Tony Khan's roof, he ain't going to make enough money to make it worthwhile. Not that any amount would. I did see some people, I guess, in anticipation of you destroying this clip, they would immediately retweet a clip of you coming off the scaffold. Oh, for fuck's sake. Apples and oranges? Yes. I'll tell you why. Because in a controlled situation, the thought was that a human being, which Bobby had done it, And Dennis had done it just like 30 seconds previously. You can hang off that fucking ladder and you can drop to your feet and you can fucking end up on your ass as I did. And you can fulfill the stipulation of the match that everybody wanted to see without giving them what they really wanted to see, which was all of us get pitched off head first. For $10,000 a piece in 1986, which is now about 30 something grand, and on the biggest show in the feature match of the biggest show the NWA ever ran. And it's not my fault that A, I'm not that athletic, and B, as I've mentioned before, when telling a story that I'd partially torn the fucking ACL early in the night without knowing what the fuck I had done when it went out in that Ronnie Garvin match, and I just put a knee, knee sleeve on and fucking still took the fucking bump. But... <sighs> It's part of a fucking full-time job that I had where I was making almost $200,000 a year 30-something years ago. (sighs) Or trying to get a job by jumping not 
necessarily head first, but it was, you know, sideways. It could goes either way. You're plummeting at that point. 20 feet to hope let somebody fucking catch you. It, it, for for a mall show payoff and the thought that you may get booked by some of these other people to do it again? Believe me, that was going to be my fucking bump off the scaffold. <laughs> Especially the way it turned out. They never asked again. <clears throat> but uh, I think apples and oranges. I mean, tell me if I'm full of shit. I agree. Um, you know, I don't know if I've asked you this before. All the scaffold matches you guys did, because obviously in Mid-South, you did a whole run of them. I'm not even going to count the one you did with Stan a year later, part of the conspiracy yeah. to give you guys bad matches at Starcade. <laughs> <year. laughs> yeah. But um, in Mid-South and then there, did Bobby or Dennis ever have any injuries from taking falls off the scaffold? And did Bill Watts ever try to get you up on the scaffold? And also, what were the paydays? or Was there a bump in your payday for the scaffold matches? at the end of 84 in Mid-South? Oh, God, yes. Um, well, first of all, no. In in Louisiana, because it, probably number one, they knew, well, fuck, Cornette will probably kill himself, and he's fixing to leave anyway. We don't want to do that to him. But it was enough for the Midnight to take the bump, lose the belts to the rock and roll, and return the favor for them putting us over all year. Um, secondly, as you will recall, it was a different scaffold set up in mid south was fucking 16 feet right so it was more like um um a, a 12 foot or 13 foot drop from scaffold level to ring and even and bobby you know turned his bobby turned his ankle on the starcade bump too first dennis if you go back and watch the tapes as he did everything perfectly he did the scaffold bump perfectly too. He would land in such a way that he landed flat on his fucking feet and suddenly whipped backwards into a back bump and started selling, shaking his legs and his whole body where it looked like he just stove himself up and he couldn't fucking walk and he never hurt himself. Bobby, because he was usually swinging after having been kicked back and forth from the rock and roll monkey barn. Sometimes he just let, a, let go and came down at an odd angle. <clears throat> and the scaffold or the Starcade match, he did turn his turn his ankle or sprain his ankle a little bit. And, you know, because he went more on his hips, a little, a little shook up. Yes, but not any major injury. Um, But no, they never asked me, uh, you know, to do it in Mid-South because it wasn't necessary. And, you know, like I said, I, I, then I probably would have had to say something at that point anyway, because I'm like, fuck, we got to go to Dallas. Um. Was there a bump in our pay? Definitely, because that was the second biggest house in Houston, for example, of the year. The The last Stampede show did a hundred and, what was it, $102,000. The fire marshal was there the night of the scaffold, which pissed us off, and they cut it off at $89,800. We could have sold more standing room. But still, that's a fucking $2,000 payoff each, which is the equivalent of, you know, what, almost six grand a day. <clears throat> and that was just for one night. Um, you know, yes, they were doing it every night, but they were once it was with the rock and roll. They weren't going to fucking do anything screwy up there. Um, they were taking safe bumps. So, you know, yeah, the bump and pay on doing that in what, 13 or 14 major markets over the last month we were in the territory, including the Superdome, which there was another two grand or whatever. Um I, I don't have my book in front of me. I should have said, I didn't know you were going to ask the question, but we probably made $15,000 that month. What is that? Uh, almost, well, maybe 12 ish or something. That's almost 40 grand today. Yeah. So yeah, there was a bump in the pay. What was your other question? Uh, I think you answered the ones I asked, but let me ask one other one. If the 86 scaffold was 20 feet, and Mid South was 16 feet. How much was Jerry Jarrett and Don Green? Oh, 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 yeah. The, the, well, hold on here a second. No, the the Starcade scaffold was 24 feet. 24 feet. Okay. Because the, the the sections of scaffolding are eight feet, right? And then you put the the ladder across. So we'd use two sections in Mid South. It was about you know 16 feet. So say, you know, you're, it, when you were hanging, you, your feet had seven, seven feet or so to go. Maybe it's 14 feet off the thing. Anyway, 
Uh, that fucking starcade was three eight foot fucking sections. It was twenty four feet off the floor and twenty one feet off the ring. And that was when we went out and saw that. We were like, oh fuck, because it just we had seen it set up. It, but when we did that previous pre tape, and that was enough. But then when you to see it in the arena that night and doing it, and especially after we knew what the finish was going to be, which because I didn't know until three days before and he wanted me to take the fucking bump too. And then I'm looking at it in a whole new light. Um, Jerry Jarrett and Don Green basically had two fucking step ladders set up and a fucking board across. <laughs> it was 12 feet. They advertised it as 12 feet. So a six foot guy hanging, his feet were four feet off the fucking ground. And the people, every time they were just sitting there and, and they would lean a leg over, you see the, the sellout crowd, the film is on the the DVD that accompanies Tuesday night at the gardens, the film of the entire match, the first ever scaffold match, 1971 in Louisville. Um, the people are going crazy. Like somebody's being beheaded at just the thought that somebody might fall off this fucking thing. And then finally the finish is Don green going off and breaking his wrist, which, you know, kept him out of the territory for six weeks to show how dangerous it was. And the people went insane. That's, that was, for years, I think until they raised prices several times, and then I, I think uh, probably the Roughhouse Fargo 1982 show that drew 6,000 people would have been the first thing to beat that uh, at the gate because the place was packed. That's the, the the match that everybody always remembered in Louisville wrestling history that was the place was packed and the scene was crazy and, oh, my God, the people went ape shit. How did they set it up? Like, what led to that being the stipulation to blow that off? Well, because actually Jerry Jarrett told the story here on the program one time, and, and our researchers will probably find it and put it up on YouTube. But he saw this fucking B-movie late, late on TV one night where the two gladiators had a fight to determine the winner of the kingdom or whatever when they had knocked a big tree down across the canyon. And they walked out across this huge tree trunk and had the fight in the middle, and the loser obviously would fall to his death. And he said, I could do a match like that. And the reason for it was because Don and Al Green and their manager, Sir Clements, had been fucking Jerry Jarrett and Tojo Yamamoto around for the Southern Tag Team title so long and so much that finally, and then they did an angle to specifically target Jarrett, and his revenge to where he could get even one-on-one -on -one with Don Green without his brother Al or his manager interfering. Well, there's no way they can get up on that scaffold. It's only it's a fucking stepladder. But the people believed it because it, they, it was built like this, and they'd never seen anything like it. The, the manager can't get up there and interfere. His brother, and they're all banned from ringside. It's just going to be us two with no interference, and the, the best man wins. Is it, his, He originally played around with it, Jarrett did, a couple years earlier in Memphis when they had a Roman gladiator death match where they wrestled on a plank and the loser was the guy that got fouled off, but they didn't actually call it a scaffold match. So he decided to do it when he opened up Louisville and Louisville started doing really good business. He said, well, fuck, I can do a sellout with this goddamn gimmick. And he did. So then they were every few years, you'd see one pop up and nothing ever replicated the success of that one, but they started getting bigger. I remember when they did a scaffold match in the summer of 82 between Bill Dundee and Coco Ware in Louisville and drew about 6,000 people off of the legend of the scaffold match. But this time they actually had scaffolding set up and a ladder across and the whole nine yards. It, originally Jerry Jarrett and Don Green just had the step ladders and a fucking board. And sold the goddamn gardens out. You said you were told three days in advance of Star Kid 86 that you were taking the bump. How were you told? Where were you told? Um, what The one time of the year that you actually got the finishes for, and maybe, you know, Flair, if he was going to lose the world title, would obviously be an exception. But you got to, the, your finish when you got to the building for the show. But since Starcade was a, a big deal and Dusty knew he was going to be busy and he wanted everybody to have time to at least, you know, think about that. Uh, he called, I guess it was uh, Thanksgiving was a Thursday. So what was it a Monday or a Tuesday? He called everybody in one day on the crew to the office in Charlotte 
individually and got their matches together and told him, this is kind of what I want. So think about it. And that's what he said. And then Cornette, so that the people won't remember that the Midnight Express lost the match. You get your heat back, baby. They're going to corner you. They're going to chase you up the scaffold. And you're going to run out in the middle and you're trapped. And I'm like, oh, as soon as they said chase, as he said, chase me up the scaffold, I might, I'm sure I shit myself. Cause I had no idea that was fucking coming. And, uh, and then when he got to the part, we said, and they're on one side and on the other side. So you get down underneath the thing and you're hanging and you just kick your feet up, baby, just kick your feet up. And they catch you like they catch the girls playing, you know, the girl cheerleaders at the football game, <laughs> you know, I, cause there's big Bubba Rogers and the biggest man in the world and the midnight express, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's when I started looking because before we'd seen it set up, I said, well, it's fucking big. But, you know, Bobby and Dennis, they'd done this. They'll drop foot first, you know, whatever. He wanted me to kick my feet up and they were going to catch me in their fucking arms. And that's when we looked at it with that in mind. I said, fuck, I'll kill all of us. So we went to the plan B. But that I've told that story before. But that's, you know, he yeah, he called us in a couple of days beforehand and just had every each match come in individually. And then boom, and then... Goddamn, I spent two days trying not to tell my wife. I didn't tell my wife at the time. She knew when she saw me coming off of it because uh, I was afraid she'd <laughs> be able to talk me out of it, and then I'd have to go say no to Dusty Rhodes. And that's she what there? Yes. Oh, wow. <clears throat> yeah, but fortunately, I was so injured, she couldn't really be mad. <laughs> uh, but when she wasn't around, I, I would be practicing like – because how do you practice – going from sitting on the top of a fucking ladder with a platform on it to going, hanging over the side. Right. I'm like, there is an element of head first to the fucking ground involved in getting under there and getting a good grip. And I was trying to do it on my bed. I'm like, I'm leaning over the bed and trying to figure out how I'm going to grab the underneath. And finally, that's why I got together with animal because it, it, I animal and Ellering chased me up and corner. Ellering chased me up. Animal cornered me on the other side. The reason why Animal was up there was because he was the strongest one of the fucking bunch. And as soon as I would sit down to try to lean over and get away from him, he would grab my leg. And I knew that he could hold me upside down by my leg if he had to. So he'd grab my leg while I got my grip. And when I got my grip, I would scream as one would in that situation, let go of me, which was his cue to let go of me so that I could hang underneath the thing. So for a second air animal was my fucking safety harness from not going head first and killing myself. Okay. So that's all with Dennis. How was the conversation when all of a sudden stands in the team and you find out you're doing it again at star kid 87? Well, that, well, we were disappointed because we wanted to work with the rock and roll express at star just not on the fucking scaffold. Cause we could have had such a, not only such a great match and gave the people more for their money and made ourselves look good. Um, and put them over and still, you know, looked good, but just not had to go up there and do that. She, cause nobody it's risky. Anything can happen. Nobody wanted to do it. We wanted to do it in at Starcade 86 with the road warriors or the blow off in Louisiana with the rock and roll, because those were those drew those sold tickets based on that match and on the merits of that match. And we made more money for it <clears throat> in, in at Starcade 87. It was stuck on the show that was going to sell out live anyway. And as it turned out was going to be doomed on pay-per-view anyway. And it wasn't really called for. It was just a rerun of what we'd done the year before. So any regular match with the rock and roll with any other stipulation in the ring would have been better, would have been easier. People would have enjoyed it more. We would have enjoyed it more. We'd have made the same amount of money. So that's why we really just hated that one. And, you know, obviously nobody was going to fucking ask me to do another one. And Stan wasn't fucking, you know, fond of it either, but he, he powered through the thing. Uh, cause he wasn't a fan of fucking heights like that is that he would have to drop to, uh, but that was then that's what lost us big Bubba because they had it. That was the final spot where he would climb up there and dare Ricky Morton to come at him and everybody would think, Oh my God, big Bubba Rogers is going to kill Ricky Morton. And then Ricky would drop down and punch Bubba in the fucking nuts and scurry off on his hands and knees. Now, ah, that would be the, you know, thing that people would remember. Right which was a little blah and a little ha ha after, you know, the previous one also. So we're going downhill, 
Well, when then we got our checks and everybody in the match got 10 grand and fucking Bubba got five. And he's, well, I climbed up the goddamn thing and was standing up there too, getting hit in the nuts. And I get half the fucking money. And that's when he took the call from Vince to go work with Hulk. So, cause he felt unappreciated <clears throat> and which was a good call for him because then he was calling me a few months later. So yeah, I just made 12 grand last week. But, but yeah, the Starcade 87, it was a bad sequel. It was like Halloween two. <laughs> Or no, which no Halloween three was the bad one. Season of the Witch. I don't know which yeah. Halloween killed the town. That would be Star Kid eighty seven. Well, there you go. Anyway, all right. You know, goddamn, I need. I wish I just had something to calm down. Now you've you've riled me up again. I thought I was going to be in a good mood today, and you've riled me up again talking about how we fucking had bad scaffold matches. <laughs> I didn't say bad. Well, it was a good scaffold match, but all even a good scaffold match is a bad match. But anyway. Um, if I just had something to calm me down, oh, I know, here's an idea. We've talked about our friends at calm.com. Um, you know, and if you're a normal person, this shit can work for you folks. It's just, I'm, I think I'm too far gone. I'm an example of the banjo string being wound to its tightest, but everybody talks about their physical fitness, but there's another side of things. It's just as important. Mental fitness, sleep and meditation can help you out. LeBron James says this, and he's a big-time athlete, so if he says it, it must be true. And at calm.com, at C-A-L-M, by the way, calm.com slash J-C-E, you use that code to get 40% off a Calm premium membership, and you can have access to things and programs and apps that help you sleep better, ease stress, help you focus, and for a limited time only now, that 40% discount is good. For an annual membership at calm.com, calm.com slash JCE, people can be calmed down by meditation and sleep. And I, I found out when I went without sleep here last week for quite a while, I don't recommend it. It's always better to sleep than not sleep. You'll be happier. Right? I think so. Even LeBron James says getting good sleep and finding time to rest is one of the most valuable things I can do for my body and mind. I have heard him say that many times. He mentioned it to me the last time I spoke with him on the phone. That's right. All right. If you want to see me at my calmest, if you want to see me out in public in person, you have two chances in the month of March, and that's very unusual, twice the same month to do it. March 14th, I'm going to be in Circleville, Ohio, for Bobby Fulton's World Classic Professional Big Time Wrestling, the Fan Fest All Day, the wrestling event that night. As I mentioned here a couple of weeks ago, that's going to be my fifth decade at a professional wrestling event. And, you know, I thought about this. I'm donating my payoff and and the uh, – uh, well, I'm donating the meet and greet money to the American Cancer Society with the Midnight Express, but I'm donating my payoff for the event, as we talked about when Bobby was on the program, to that, gosh, I can't remember their name, but it's the folks that are helping uh, cancer patients go to the hospitals and the major medical centers for their treatment if they live out a ways or they don't have a way or whatever. They're getting the folks to their treatments, and they're working uh, together with Bobby on the show and I'm going to be donating my payoff to them, but I'm making Bobby give me a dollar so I can say I was a professional, uh, in five different decades on March 14th in Circleville, Ohio at the new heritage center out there at the fairgrounds <clears throat> and March 26th through 29th. I'll be in Lexington, Kentucky at Rupp arena Lexington center for LexCon with 40,000 crazy people. And my friends, Jared and Jamie Greer putting the thing on. It's the biggest comic convention of the year in the state of Kentucky. And people are coming from all over. I will be there in person selling all kinds of Cornets collectibles and buying all kinds of stuff too. And that will be my last personal appearance until August at the Charlotte gathering and my, and that's it for the rest of the year to help keep my mental fucking fitness and have less stress. That's what I'm doing is not booking personal appearance dates. So if you want to see me in person in March, that's a good chance to do it. Um, it, it, it we had a song submission on the drive through this past weekend that was so fucking good. I wanted to cross promote and cross pollinate and bring it over here to the experience. 
because everybody loved it on Twitter. And some people said, oh, come on. I can't believe you didn't make more of this. And, you know, it wasn't a, a bigger deal because it really was good. And we were just <clears> – I think part of it was the fatigue of having several substandard submissions or emissions, as the case may be, that came before it. So we were kind of blind. We were up for it. But it deserves a wider audience. And uh, Josh Hughes is the fellow that did this thing. Are you ready to to play this for the folks today? And, of course, if you're on YouTube – because they're pricks about rights and things. You probably ain't going to hear this. But otherwise, uh, Brian, do you have Josh's submission pulled up? I do have it. I should also specify there have been plenty of songs that are good enough to be played again. Not all of them are substandard, as you labeled them a second ago. But Well, no, I mean just over the past show or two, there's been a few that we've, uh, eh, you know, so we were kind of we were kind of down about it. We, it was, this came as a surprise that it was so good. Plus, there's a connection, as people who listen to the drive through found out, between you and the Romantics. You have to listen to the drive through to hear that story. But let's go to the submission right now, sent in by Josh Hughes. Jim, the submission sent in by Josh Hughes, which had received such a big reaction after being played on the drive through and still that guitar solo. What a fantastic job. I know. And by the written by sung by and played by that wasn't karaoke stuff either. Um, you were going to have to start rotating some of it. Cause some of this stuff has been too good. I mean, everyone knows it's corny is, is golden. Uh, but now there's, you know, the, the La Bamba, uh, takeoff, parody whatever the case there's there's jim Cornette's drive through is what i like about you and we got to start rotating this stuff because we don't want these things to be forgotten these are classic pieces of work yeah there's a few that i've really liked that i was surprised you didn't jump on can i play one actually since we're doing this? yeah play one you like this is one i really like maybe i just was in a bad mood that day this is what i really liked, and then i mentioned last week or two weeks ago that i really liked it and the guy who wrote it got in touch with me and said you didn't play it on the show you must have listened to it off air what? and i said no we played it on the show and then he went back and he heard it and he was very happy with the response it received this is called the defender of pro wrestling by david martin hey there i want to share the story of a man some call him the last sheriff of wrestling 
sorry if it's a little corny. Defender of the wrestling cup, tongue like a lightning bolt. Watch out, you outlaw macho fucks, he's the leader of the cult. We pledge allegiance to the leader of the mighty cult of Cornette. And to wrestling for which he stands, an experience you won't regret. No blow up those dick spots, we want blood on our screens. We want shoot angles, not video games, and fuck the dance routines. Kenny Ford, a nine year old, tracking down without a trace. Something Jim's a heel, but we know Cornette's face. Defender of a wrestling, his tag partner in his task. Robin to his Batman is the great Brian Last. So if you fight the invisible or dick clip guys like Joey, Jim will give you two great choices, drop dead or blow me. So if you use a staple gun, Jim won't be impressed. You'll spend high noon in Camp Cornette and fight Midnight Express. Defender of pro wrestling, and you know it's true. Thank you, fuck you, bye bye, the Jim Cornette drive through, drive through. It's sponsored. By Stephen P. New Silly Pockets We like sweet Stan Bring him Bobby Eaton He's a real man You can stop the tape now Brian Last The good lyrics Are running out fast <laughs> Reho. <laughs> well there it is i like that one David you know Martin. what yes i remember that now and i like that too that was a good job also i, was, I may have been cranky that day but i remember the Reho. The Reho. <laughs> oh my god so yes we'll 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 keep these things alive nobody does anything about the experience have we actually made an experience song contest we've gotten a few to the drive through about the experience, but yeah. uh, we haven't done an official contest. We well, certainly should. Somebody should do a Jimi Hendrix take, take off on Jimi Hendrix, as they used to say. Yeah, that'd anyway. be good. As long as it's not another version of Jim Dandy, because we've received, I think, four different versions. Yeah, we got a few Jim <laughs> Dandy. Maybe they, if maybe they could take off on green grass and high tides next time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, you've got something you were going to tell the people about the, the, the uh, people have been asking about us doing some Patreon, uh, business with the, uh, everybody wants to know where to get the back catalog of everything. We've done so many incarnations of both the experience and the drive through going back, what, six, seven years. And, uh, the, the, the entire catalog of everything of me from start to finish is not even all up especially in one place, but we have it and we are uh, going to be disseminating that soon. Very soon. And actually starting on March 1st, there's going to be an official Jim Cornette Patreon where you can get access to the back catalog of shows. We're going to put up one show of each, the experience in the drive through each week. Eventually it'll build up to the entire catalog being up there. And we think people are going to be really but, excited. But we're going to start out with a, a good chunk of them. You know, you're not yeah. just paying for one thing. There's going to be a chunk there, and we're going to add more as we go, because all this stuff has to be, as they say, digitized and processed and it's uh, homogenized and pasteurized. That's right. Or, or if, if not pasteurized, at least up over your ass. At least that, <laughs> I presume. But yes, we're going to have an official Patreon. Stay tuned for more information starting March 1st. And so many people wanted the back catalog. You will get that. And I'm very happy to say that there will also be other content that we are developing exclusively for Patreon, including, but not limited to, so many people have enjoyed when you were on the 605 Super Podcast and we would watch a clip from YouTube and do commentary over it, shed some insight or maybe share some laughs over what we were watching. There will be more of that coming very, very soon. More of that. More of that. The watch-alongs, as they say. And I've, I've, we're going to sync it up. It's going to be like the synchronicity between um, the dark side of the moon and the Wizard of Oz. We're going we're gonna to pick clips, and we're going to tell you where to sync it up, and we're going to talk about it while it happens so you have more understanding of these things is what we're going to be doing. And that's one of the things. But we're not going to – there's going to be an entry level on this. The only reason we're charging anything – is because you, this is literally now thousands of hours of audio that we have in these archives. And to go through this and get this suitable to put up, we have to make something off of it. But it's going to be cheap. But that's going to be this is going to be the answer for the people 
of where can I get everything? There's been till now, there's no place that everybody could listen to everything. And now there's going to start being that. That's right. Plus more. Plus more. <laughs> now with tomato. <laughs> you never know. Hold on. I'm going to blow my nose. Just talk to the people for a second. Thankfully, Jim has put us on mute because very often he doesn't do this. He coughs, he burps, he blows his nose, and I get to hear it. I try to edit it out of the show as much as I can, but sometimes it's near impossible. I assume he is still blowing said nose right now. I'm done blowing. I just want to leave you twisting in the wind like they used to leave me at Crockett's promos. <laughs> um, I want to. We talk so much about Twitter because there's so many stupid people on there that you know, we can talk about, but I, I want to talk about my blocking policy. I finally figured out how to say this. I figured it out because somebody tweeted it and I'm just stealing it. But you know, a lot of people get blocked by me on Twitter. If for, I've, I've actually, I've come out and said, if you do such and such, you will be blocked by me on Twitter. And then I, that's when I weed some of the more egregious examples out. I mean, if you support Donald fucking Trump, you're blocked. If you're one of these fucking hashtag 2A patriotic militia gun nuts that don't want any goddamn laws of any kind on what fuck people can walk around owning and possessing, you're blocked. If you're a generic right-wing fucking fanatic that I just don't want to listen to your bullshit, you're blocked. If you like the cosplay wrestlers and think wrestling ought to be silly and fun and entertaining and nobody should take it seriously, you're blocked. And if you say anything... Pretty much the only way I can describe it is smart ass to me and run your fucking dick liquor about me. You're blocked. These are simple concepts to understand, right? Brian, is this, have I said anything that should be <clears throat> in any way surprising to people? I think anyone who listens to the program or knows anything about you shouldn't be surprised by what would trigger you to block them. With that said, well, there, there you go. Obviously, I hear from a lot of people, and I feel bad because I don't get involved in this thing. When people say, hey, I'm a big fan of the show, I listen to the show, or hey, I buy merchandise from Cornette's Collectibles, why did Jim block me? Can you find out? And the answer well, is no, I'm not getting involved. <laughs> well, but see, you can't find out anyway because I don't know after I block somebody. I don't know what, because I've blocked, I don't know, is there a way to determine how many people you have blocked on Twitter? Mine's got to be 10,000 easily no way really I blo I've, blo I've easily blocked seven eight hundred people in the last couple of weeks wow um i don't know how you find that out <clears throat> but anyway if if i see and it's not like i'm taking notes like oh i gotta remember what he said no i just scroll down the thing and if i don't like the tone of your fucking comment you're fucking blocked and so and then you move on with your day and then i move on so um sometimes and i will admit there are a few exceptions to this if I don't like the tone of your comment, but I have a feeling that I'm going to be saying something about you in the near future, if I'm going to be talking about you, I usually don't block you because I want you to know what I'm saying about you because I want you to know I think you're a piece of shit. But if it's just some average nobody fucking mark off Twitter, I just block them. Now, there have been some <clears throat> people that have written me that have pleaded in a convincing case that they were caught in like a spray or a crossfire and that I took something sarcastic out of context when they were actually trying to defend me or they really did. And cause I like, if you send me a clip of the invisible man, you're blocked, but they were trying to like literally get me to rip it up and tear it to shreds and talk about, you know, how stupid it was and they didn't mean anything. So every once in a while I'll unblock somebody if I get an email with a pleading like that. But for the most part, um, you know, <laughs> I, I finally know how to describe this when this guy tweeted, he said, because some people say, well, if you block me, you're a coward. You don't want to engage in a discussion. You don't want to debate our ideas. No, because your ideas are stupid and you're an idiot or you wouldn't think this. And I don't have time out of my day to smarten your fucking lame ass up. So I'll just block you. It's not that I'm scared of you. I block you the same way that I treat dog shit on my shoes. I scrape the dog shit off my shoes, not because I'm scared of said dog shit. But because said dog shit is annoying, gets all over everything, and smells like shit. So I scrape or block accordingly, right? Also, <clears throat> I tweet shit that I think is funny or perceptive or retweet stuff. If, if I retweet something that is in 
in support of anybody against this fucking criminal piece of shit asshole president. And somebody writes back and says, well, the Democrats are such just as bad. What chances are you're blocked too? Because you didn't need to make that comment. And if you're going to make a stupid comment like anything in the world, including Ebola and the coronavirus is as bad as the fucking demon seed piece of shit in the White House, you're stupid and you're blocked. But I tweet shit that I think is funny or perceptive. I retweet that I think is funny or perceptive that I think that people who like me and who agree with me will think the same thing about. And I like to bring those folks joy. That's why I do that. Otherwise, <clears throat> I got to be honest with you, I don't really give a fuck. And Brian, do you know what it would mean to me? Because a lot of people are saying, well, Cornette's burning a lot of bridges on Twitter. And one thing, if you burn a bridge on Twitter, fuck it. Do you know what it would mean to me if everybody in the world got mad at me and just refused to speak to me anymore? I think it would probably mean that you'd be a happy guy sitting at home being left alone, quite frankly. More free time. That's what people not speaking to me would mean to me. So, as I said, I don't usually block people if I intend to be speaking to them or about them, just unknown dipshits. But there was, <clears throat> over the last week or so, there was one unknown dipshit that blocked me and then decided to start talking shit about me. And I don't like that. Because if you're going to talk shit about me, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt because I don't give a fuck what you think, but I want to know about it so that I can respond to you accordingly. Because that's another thing. Some people think that they can just bandy my name around in their fucking pie holes and I'm not going to say anything about it. If I see it and I don't agree with it, I'm going to say something about it. You take that chance. So this guy, who he claims to be a journalist, I'm not saying, by the way, it's not Uncle Dave Meltzer. Uncle Dave has not blocked me, and I have not blocked him. Because I'm sure he wants me to see the stupid things that he's saying. And I'm sure that I probably will, and I will probably respond at some point in the future to more of the stupid shit he says. However, this little weasel claims to be a journalist, but blocked me a while back without telling me about it so that he could then make comments on me or about me allegedly thinking that I wouldn't fucking know about it to keep some heat off of him because he's a whiny little bitch type. So let's just, let's make up a name. Let's call him bitch. The journalist because he claims to be a journalist. He's another one of these people that claims to be a journalist. Let me explain something. I'm a proponent of the art of journalism, the profession of journalism, and the concept of a free press in general. I've mentioned before, my father worked in the state capital of Frankfurt when he was president of the Kentucky Press Association, worked directly with the governor of the state of Kentucky for not only freedom of the press standards and <clears throat> clauses and statutes and et cetera, the Kentucky statutes, but also fairness of the press, because a free press has to be fair. People should be able to disseminate information, even in the Trump era, with this prick trying to now control every part of the government. People should be able to disseminate true information with freedom, such as the people like it at the Washington Post or at the New York Times. But it should be fair. It should have to be true. It should hold up to scrutiny. It should be researched. It should be well-written. That's fairness of the press, not just freedom. <clears throat> so if Bob Woodward wants to do a piece on me, I'm fine with that, whether it's positive or negative, because it's Bob fucking Woodward, and he's a journalist. People who have gone to school to become journalists. Dave Meltzer has worked at legitimate newspapers. People who have degrees and experience in this field and who are paid professionals at what they do they got the right to say shit as long as it's valid. But people like bitch the journalist is not a journalist at all. What he is, is he's a fucking muckraker. He tries to stir his own shit up, then write about it, then sell it for 25 bucks or 50 bucks or maybe 100 bucks if it's Colt Cabana to websites of varying quality and professionalism and standards ranging from ho-hum to... 
And because there's so many websites these days and everybody thinks that they can cover wrestling and write about wrestling or need to, there's all kinds of people that will pay even a fictitious individual like Bitch the Journalist for his effluvia of opinions, none of which that he has the background, the knowledge, the substance, or the, the actual proof to make. But yet some of them will make these asides and cast these aspersions <laughs> and poke the bear, as some people say. And let's just hypothetically say that I even mentioned a few months ago online to bitch the journalist when he chimed in on something else that didn't involve him, involving me and someone else that we had never had a problem and he should probably keep it that way. And why was he commenting on something that didn't concern him or include him? That's when he blocked me so he could talk behind my back about me. Let me just say once again that journalists and journalism is fine. But just as I think that the professionalism level overall in the wrestling industry has gone downhill and anybody can do this shit these days, the standards of journalism are lower than ever before, at least what is passes for journalism on the internet. <clears throat> and with a great variety of wrestling sites or sites who don't know enough about wrestling and don't bother enough to find out and just pay a pittance to people who put their opinions on their pages. I'll have, I'll have you know it is a fact that I watched live as it happened on network television in the middle of the night, the moon landing, when man first walked on the moon. That does not mean that my opinion is as valuable as Neil Armstrong's. But some people think that. So, let me just make this plain to everybody. If you knock me on Twitter, you knock me to my face, or you knock me in an email or whatever, if I have time and don't just scrape you off the bottom of my shoe, I'm going to make you wish you were never born, because I'm going to respond to you. Because I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks about me. And I could give two shits what anybody thinks about you. And if some unkempt, poorly groomed, spittle-lipped, basement-dwelling, socially awkward, shit-disturbing, whiny little instigating muckraker with hypochondriac tendencies, a victim complex, and a complete lack of understanding of what a whiny little bitch he is, somebody who'd need a goddamn... Rand McNally Road Atlas and a fucking electronic GPS to find the female genitalia region wants to start just making shit up or knocking me in public behind my back. Then there I am absolutely gobsmacked that he is suddenly astonished when I say something back to him. I just don't know what to tell you. But I'm not running a popularity contest around here. I'm just giving my opinions. If you've got a valid opinion to give back, then give it. I may block you, or I may not. But if you start making shit up out of nothing, like certain little spittle-lipped, slovenly little fucking slugs do, like some basement-dwelling gimps who can't even groom the pubic hair off their cheeks do, then you're going to get a response, and it's not going to be a pretty one. Is this difficult to understand? Especially when it's somebody that gets on the internet and hides behind a picture of somebody else or no picture at all and, and, and then tries to say shit about people who are right out here in front. I'm taking my bullshit and I'm putting it in both hands and I'm weaving it right under your noses, folks. I'm giving you a good whiff of it. This is what I've got. And if you don't like it, I could give two French fried titty fucks. But if you knock me, and it's important enough or it's just on the wrong day and I'm in the mood, I'm going to roast your fucking ass. All right? Should we talk about a little classic wrestling, Brian? Let's do that. Uh, real quick, let me just give a couple of plugs here, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, yes, you should do that. You have these programs that you do, and they're very fine programs. Many, many programs, and actually more to come. More shows are in development right now. But find out more about the Arcadian Vanguard family of podcasts on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes real quick here. The latest edition of the Super Studcast with Ron Fuller, patreon.com 
slash studcast. Ron talks with Lord Humongous Jeff Van Camp. This is a gimmick that various people had, including Sid Vicious, and we'll have more about that on the next Super Studcast. He's a Louisville boy. Was he a security guard at the Louisville Gardens? Is that what the story yes, is? Yes, well, I think, I think he's originally from Indiana somewhere, but he broke into business here in, in Louisville. Here, and from- I actually took a power slam from Jeff Van Camp in November of 1983, and and maybe why I haven't walked straight since then. I didn't know that. When did you work with him? We I, we worked. I think it was me and Jimmy Hart in a handicap match or uh, in in. So I got to go check my fucking 83 book now, but in a little spot show somewhere in s- Central Kentucky. Well, here from Lord Humongous, he talks Southeastern, Mid South wrestling, breaking into the business, Louisville wrestling, and so much more. Once again, patreon.com slash studcast. Also, want to make mention John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, then and now, the podcast at pwspod.com. And the original episodes that we review were right now in December of 1989, patreon.com slash Arezzi. At this point in the year, the end of the year, 1989, John is reviewing the most influential wrestlers of the 1980s. Two weeks ago, we had Larry Zabisco on, including Larry arguing with a caller right before he hangs up. And this week, Sergeant Slaughter talking about why he left the WWF, his Hasbro G.I. Joe deal, what his future plans are, as well as a prediction from him about what he will do in 1990. Hear that today, patreon.com slash Arezzi. And of course, The 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! (laughs) That's how we've been feeling the last few weeks with various illnesses and ailments. But now that we're both feeling better and the schedule is back to normal, the latest episode of the Super Podcast, the Pampero Furpo Special, will be out this weekend as you're listening to this when it debuts on Friday. So check that out. Oh, yeah! You're going to get to hear Pampero Furpo say that himself on this episode as well as a really great interview, one of my favorite interviews I think I've ever done, with Mary, the daughter of Pampero Furpo. You can hear that and so much more in episode 102 in production. A lot of people are going to want to hear this show. A lot of people are going to be talking about this show. Stay tuned for more. 605pod.com are available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. The Mothership. Well, as as a matter of fact, since it's the Valentine's Day special here on the program, I thought we would go back and look at various Valentine's Days in history as far as where I was in the wrestling business and what I was doing. A fun little exercise, because obviously I kept my records, but Brian, this was surprising even to me. Do you know that after 1989... Except for a couple of OVW TV tapings here in Louisville, I never actually worked another Valentine's Day. Really? I'm, I am surprised by that. <clears throat> I looked through this because it, when I was looking at it, okay, um, I, 1990, it was uh, WCW had already taken fur or TBS had taken firm control of WCW, and we were off. It was a Wednesday. We were just off. And then in 91, of course, I was off practically the whole year because I was setting up Smoky Mountain Wrestling. The Smoky Mountain years, Valentine's Day came between Sundays and Wednesdays when we didn't run. And then I went to Connecticut, and the only Valentine's Day, because since I was in the office and not on the road, it happened we never did a TV or a pay-per-view on Valentine's Day, except for in 1997, I was going to be at the WWE pay-per-view in Memphis, but I'd gone down early to work for Randy Hales, who was start, had started up Power Pro Wrestling, and that's when Michael Hayes knocked my front tooth out. And because at that point in time, all I was going to be doing was, <laughs> as far as an on-camera talent, was just the, the on-cameras and some announcing for syndication that we would tape that week, I was whistling <laughs> when I was talking because I had no fucking front tooth. And I'm like, fee, fee, fee. So I called JR. I said, I can't fucking go on camera. I got to go get my tooth stuck back in my head. So I went back to Connecticut and got the tooth stuck back in my fucking head. And then, like I said, during OVW, except for a couple of TV tapings or, you know, whatever, I, I never worked on Valentine's Day again. But in the 80s, of course, because that's what you did, you worked every night. I've said I worked every 4th of July, except when I had surgery. I worked every uh, Christmas. I worked every Thanksgiving. I worked every fucking everything, right? So my first one 
and and then it's it's somehow it's karma the way this this comes back full circle. But my first Valentine's Day in the business was February fourteenth, nineteen eighty three. It was a Monday night, and I was in Memphis. And that's when they that night they had a tournament for the Mid America Heavyweight Title, and I was managing Jesse Barr. So we had two matches that night. Jesse went to like I think a fifteen minute draw with Dutch Mantel, and Jesse won the coin flip to advance so that Coco Ware, Sweet Brown Sugar, who eventually won the thing, as I recall, <clears throat> could beat Jesse in the second round. But that was in front of, I don't have Mark James's book in front of me, but I have my book. It's 20, it was, the house was $25,500. And in those days in Memphis, that meant that it was probably about 6,000 people at, at those ticket prices. And because I was the junior flunky manager, you know, managing a couple of underneath matches because it's not like the Mid America Heavyweight Title Tournament was the draw that night of the fucking show. Um, I got paid 150 bucks, which running it through our inflation calculator, it makes about 388 dollars in today's money. So, as a matter of fact, hold on one second. You can edit here if you like. If I like, what are you getting? Your inflation calculator. I'm getting another book. Oh, another book. So many books. Here, that out. That's not it. <laughs> the goddamn book, though. I'm not in charge of books, Ron. Here it is. <clears throat> All right. That was entertaining for everybody. February 14... 1983, according to the Memphis Commercial Appeal, yes, I was, I was almost right, 6,437 fans. The main event was the AWA World Heavyweight title match with no seconds or managers at ringside between Nick Bockwinkel and Jerry Lawler. And uh, that was pretty much, and then Jacques Rougeau versus Terry Taylor for the Southern title. So we know what drew the fucking house, and then we were underneath. So, as I said, I made 150 bucks. The following year, <clears throat> Valentine's Day 1984 was a Tuesday, and we were in Mid-South. We were in Alexandria, Louisiana. The house was $11,800 because it was a Tuesday night in Alexandria, and the Midnight Express beat Magnum TA in Wrestling 2 by disqualification for the Mid-South Tag Team title. And I got paid another $150 because it was Tuesday night and we were home in Alexandria, which is about another $300 and dollars. Believe it or not, February 14th, 1985. You would have been in Texas now. Was a Thursday and we were off because... <laughs> <laughs> they didn't run that many spot shows in the wintertime. And, and besides that, uh, they probably just wanted to be off on Valentine's Day. So we got a break. But here's what was, was actually surprising to me. I thought February 14th, 1986 was going to be a big fucking day, right? We were in Cincinnati, Ohio at the Cincinnati Gardens. And the house was only $26,000. And this was in 1980. So we were with the Rock and Roll Express for the World Tag title. It was a big card. The rock and roll beat us by disqualification. We retained the belts. But Cincinnati, which I believe it was uh, two weeks later, or three weeks later, we'd go back with the rematch and the rematch between, I think, Flair and Dusty. And that's when we sold the gardens out. $100,000 house. But on this night, Friday night of Valentine's Day, maybe the, the guys just had something better to do with their uh, female friends. Well, let, and, if I can ask you to that question, because I know, you know, one of the stories about wrestlers during these years was you didn't always get to be home on the holidays. You didn't get to be home for birthdays. And it was even hard to take off for a friend's wedding. You know, I mean, things like that. And you wrestled on Thanksgiving. You, you wrestled. You, on well, you wait a minute. You remember that story? I asked I asked Dusty one time when when Bolin got married back in 87. I said, uh, you know, Dusty, my best friend at home is getting married on such and such a date kind of, cause I'd never, I never asked Dusty Rhodes specifically for a day off. I notified them when I had to have surgery, but I never asked for a day off. Right. And I said, uh, he's getting married on such and such a date. And Dusty said, 
I hope it's getting mad in Greensboro, baby, because that's where you're going to be that night. <laughs> well, that's... And, and I was like, okay, because Greensboro in those days, that's a $1,000 payoff. That's like fucking three grand a day. Yeah, okay, I'll be there. To that point, there are all these days where you couldn't be home with your family. Was Valentine's Day a big deal? Because, I mean, would guys have really wanted that day amongst all the days to be home with their girlfriend or their wife or whatever it may be? Well, th their girlfriend or wife would have wanted them to have it. And if it was fucking... Water Valley, Mississippi, they probably would have been one had been home too, but most you didn't ask for days off back then because the one time we asked for days off in Mid South, it was long about summertime. We've been going six months where I think I remember I told you the longest I ever went was 103 days without a day off. And that was still doing promos on Wednesday every morning and fucking some double shots on Sundays. <clears throat> so finally we went to Dundee and we said, Bill, we're breaking down. Just can we just have some days off just this month coming up? Just some days. So we got Houston off and New Orleans off. All oh, the big man. Oklahoma City off. We, <laughs> you know, we were making cross at Arkansas, but we got the because they just said, okay, we'll have another goddamn little fucking angle with the rock and roll, whoever we were working with at that time, the Fantastics, they'll get another challenger, whatever. We got all the big towns off. So we didn't add, we had about six or eight of them. We didn't ask for any more days off after that. But no, you know, if, if you weren't, well, and you'd been insane to take Christmas or Thanksgiving off anyway, those are the two biggest days of the year, but you just, you, you know, you went where you went, but the guys bring their, their ladies around though, their wives or girlfriends again, or whatever it may be. No. Well, for one thing, we're in Cincinnati. We all live in Charlotte. We're going to fly our fucking wives and girlfriends to Cincinnati to watch us get beat up at the fucking gardens. And then you didn't necessarily bring the wives or girlfriends around because they would meet the other wives and girlfriends of the same people. But, it's a wrestling business. But like specifically a Thanksgiving and you're wrestling in. Oh, yeah. Well, Thanksgiving or Christmas or yeah. or Starcade or something like that. Yeah. A and lot of guys. And, home. and the Great American Bash in the summertime. You'd, that's why the, you know, there's Cody Rhodes was driving one of the fucking. Uh, no, it wasn't Dustin. Cody. Goddamn, he wasn't born yet. It was Dustin. Dustin Rhodes was driving with the, the teenage kid driving one of the carts to the ring at the Memorial Stadium in Charlotte for the 87 bash. That's on tape. Um, <laughs> yes, you would. And then you would keep the wives and girlfriends all in there. They created a space for them where they'd be safe and nobody would bother them. And also where nobody would, could get to them and talk to them about what their fucking husbands and boyfriends were doing at the wrestling matches that they didn't get to go to very often for all those reasons and more. Um, but anyway, still t Cincinnati, I believe we were a main event, $26,000 house. We got paid $475. That is equivalent to $1,118 today. So we got $1,118 a piece for a bad house in Cincinnati. In 1987, I was uh, actually will bring up. I was about to bring up what you just asked about. Did you ever ask for days off? Well, this would have been the one because I got married for the first time on February 16th, 1987. And you're saying, well, fuck, if you're going to get married on a Monday, February 16th, why wouldn't you just get married on Saturday, February 14th? Because that was Charlotte, the Charlotte Coliseum. And since I did ask, that's the one time I should, the one time I did ask Dusty for time off to get married myself, not to go to another wedding. I, we were going to go to Hawaii. We we're going to get married and we we're going to go to Hawaii. I'm going to be gone nine days. I believe it was <clears throat> nine or 10 because I came back to the bunkhouse stampede in Pittsburgh, the all time record house with Bubba and Dusty, 166 grand sold out 16,600 people. I came back for that one. That was my first day back from fucking now on my second day back, the first day back, we were in Minneapolis. I went from Hawaii in February to Minneapolis. I believe it was. Anyway, nevertheless. But you had, did you get days off after you injured your knee at Starcade? Well, yeah, but I didn't ask for those. I just had to take them. I came, I, I don't have my book in front of me. that was but two I think months was, before this. Oh, yeah. I only took 10 days off. I came back. See, I, Starcade was Thanksgiving night, and I had surgery. I had the evaluation the next day and had surgery the next day, and I think I took 10 more days, and I came back on crutches because the weekend before the Christmas break was Chicago. 
and then was at the Rosemont Horizon. I, no, it, yeah, that was our debut at the Rosemont. <laughs> that was our debut in Chicago. We did 150 grand that weekend. And it was also another couple of big shows. And in Atlanta TV, we made like three or four grand that weekend. So I had to, so I came back on crutches to make those shows. And then I had another 10 days for the Christmas break before we had to come back Christmas Day to rest it further. So I still came back way too quick, but I wasn't getting paid. But I didn't ask for those days off. I did, it was just kind of assumed. They said, well, let us know when you can walk again and you're coming back. Um, but so anyway, February 14th of 87 was a show at the Charlotte Coliseum. They were doing TV, uh, for the syndicated shows. And that was the night that the midnight worked with Ronnie Garvin and Barry Windham for the U S tag team title. And we got disqualified for setting Ronnie's face on fire. And he, that's when he went up like the challenger. <laughs> and <clears throat> the reason for that was because dusty knew I was going to be gone. For 10 days, I would miss a few, a couple sets of TV tapings. And he's like, okay, we'll suspend him. And he came up with the reason to suspend me and the reason why that we would continue this program with Garvin and Wyndham for the tag, the U.S. tag title and blah, 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 was that I would set his face on fire. And that's when he taught, taught me how to fucking throw the fireball. And I'd had no practice in front of people, right? I did a couple in the locker room, but it's not like on the job in the ring. So that's when Ronnie Garvin had looked at me and said, make sure it makes, it looks good now, you know, with his accent and the, that, you know, intimidating stare that he had. So I said, okay, so I used like three sheets of paper. And if you scrunch it up real tight, it's a small hot ball that goes away. But if you kind of leave it loose, it's a bigger ball that kind of fluffs up. Right. So I had three sheets loosely crumpled and that lighter, and when I hit that thing and it went up, it goes up because it's lighter than air. So I just, with both hands, cup it and throw it up. And Ronnie stuck his face right out there. And I, that thing stuck to his fucking face. And, it, and I've told the story before, but it was amazing <clears throat> to see it. When you go back and look at it, they played it in slow motion. When he took the bump and he's rolling around on the mat, his face is still smoking. It's still, it burned all the eyebrows, nose hair, first layer of skin of his cheeks ear hair i think and it his face was on fucking fire right in front of me i'm like oh shit that turned out good and you know and then we go and then we do the angle where we switch jimmy baby face and the whole nine yards the house that night was eighty one thousand dollars then charlotte was a town that we ran if not once a month every three weeks it was more than 12 shows a year we were there at least once every month sometimes twice so in this case $81,000 house, 7,000 plus people. That's 183 grand in today's money. We were not the main event. As a matter of fact, hold on here one second. I'll tell you who was because it was a TV taping and I don't remember what the advertised main event was, but since I'm looking that up, Ric Flair versus Nikita Koloff for the NWA title. And then us and then some TV matches, right? Like Ivan Koloff and Dick Murdoch beat Keith Patterson and Brody Chase. Oh, and also <clears throat> Manny Fernandez and Rick Rude against the Rock and Roll Express. So there was really, there was three main events. That show did that. We got paid eight, I got paid $810, which is the equivalent of $1839 in today's money. So I'm moving up, right? And then after that, I left the next day to go. We got married in Texas and then went to Hawaii. And I was gone, like I said, for 10 days. Why Texas? Um, that's where she was from. Okay. So, oh, so that's how Paul Bosch attended your wedding. Yes. <laughs> because I'd invited Bruce Pritchard. And when Paul Bosch found out about the invitation, he said, well, do you think he'd mind if I come? <laughs> Fuck it. Bruce called me. I said, of course not. And Joey, his son, played a little piano. with the, And Gene Kaniski was there also. What? <laughs> Gene, Gene Kaniski, Kaniski went wedding? to my first wedding. Yes. <laughs> Well, because, because Kelly was wrestling at down there? the time, Kelly was wrestling in, in Dallas at world-class and his girlfriend was friends with my intended. So, and he just happened to be in town. So I'm the only person probably in wrestling that had Gene Kaniski and Paul Bosch both at their first wedding. Wow. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, but so I went to Hawaii and I didn't know what the, for the first time since I'd been in the business five years, right? I didn't know what the fuck was going on. There was no internet. 
I wasn't home to get my mail to read the Observer. I wasn't certainly calling back to the mainland when I'm staying at these resorts. And by the way, th that Charlotte show, and th we did Atlanta TV two tapes that morning, then flew back to Charlotte, did that show. But that paid for half my wedding and 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 the honeymoon because back then a couple grand got you 10 days in fucking Hawaii, you know, with at these nice resorts. So anyway, we just adjusted to, you know, have our Valentine's Day and our wedding on February 16th. But I don't know what the fuck's going on in this country. I don't know what the fuck's going on in wrestling. And that's when I came back and got back to all the fucking mail and all the talk the fucking, they had showed the tape of me burning him on every show and the slow-mo with his face on fire. And I had the death threats in the mail and the, you know, the advances for the, the return matches are coming up and we're booked with these guys. And that's where Dusty ended up getting the idea to blow it off with me and Ronnie in a cage individually, which we'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> but that is some of the most heat, especially for anything not involved in the rock and roll express that we, or baby doll time we hit, hit her once. That's the most heat we ever got for anything. They bought it. They believed it. His face really did go up in flames. So when I got back and saw all that, and of course I had called Ronnie that night, right? As soon as I got back home, I called him at home. I said, Ronnie, are you all right? I'm thinking, oh God, he's going to case. No, it was great. Shit. No, the fucking, my eyebrows are gone. The fucking nose hair is gone. My cheeks are fucking red. It was great. I told you, you laid it in there. Okay. So, it just the fans that wanted to kill me, at least not Ronnie. That was less dangerous to have the fans after you than Ronnie Garvin. But anyway, that was a big house in Charlotte, and that led to three months later, after the tag matches and everything, one of the places, we did the cage a couple of different places, but one of them, the main one, was May 9th, 1987 in Charlotte. And I found out not only was it me versus Ronnie Garvin in the main event in the Charlotte Coliseum, but that there was another show that night in St. Petersburg at the Bayfront Center, and they had Flair against Dusty. They had Barry Windham. They had the Road Warriors. They had Fernandez and Rude. They had Jimmy Garvin, Kevin Sullivan, Dory Funk Jr., the Armstrongs. We had half a card, and I was on top of it. So I said, fuck, this has got a fucking draw, or I'm going to look like shit, right? So I went out, that's when I went out on TBS, and I did all this stuff on my own. Dusty said, go out and cut promos, get this shit over. I'm not telling you what to say, I'm telling you what to talk about. So as long as I didn't just go completely out of my mind, he loved what I was doing. So that's when I started the campaign, save me from this evil homicidal maniac Ronnie Garvin. They announced the match, and I tried to get the people to sign petitions, send telegrams, send letters to Jimmy Crockett, to the NWA, and we started getting some. Please, no matter what he's done, he doesn't deserve this. <laughs> I said, save you. You've got to write in or save me. I'm going to be killed. He's going to rip me limb from limb. He's going to disembowel me. And I got people talking about it that way. And then on the local Charlotte promos, I'm out there. I'm shedding tears. I'm crying. I'm clutching on to Tony Schiavone. Somebody's got to help me. Even the Midnight Express can't keep this lunatic away from me. And I went on the, the morning radio in Charlotte because they, they'd had me do guest spots. I even filled in one time for a, a week. That was a year later. I filled in for the morning guys, me and one of the afternoon guys for a week one time on one of the rock stations. So they'd let me in all the time because we were on TV, but the, we were bigger stars than the DJs in those days in Charlotte. And I did morning radio. And I got Tom Sorensen at the Charlotte Observer to write a column on the big cage match, calling it Cage Gate. Cornette claims conspiracy. And we got a front page blurb on, on that Friday's Charlotte Observer. The match was on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, I believe. We got the front page blurb. Cornette cries cage gate next to the fucking plug of the Neil Diamond concert that weekend. So I did all this shit, right? Because <clears throat> I was determined, we're, you know, the, the fucking card. Hold on, let me give you this. Wait a minute. I'll find it right here. Here's the entire card. Ivan Koloff versus Todd Champion. New Breed versus Rocky King and Italian Stallion. Baron Von Raschke versus Thunderfoot. Lasertron versus Nelson Royal. Do you see where this is going? The Rock and Roll Express versus Vladimir Pietrov and Dick Murdoch. Then finally, Tully Blanchard versus Ole Anderson. Nikita Koloff versus Lex Luger. 
and Ronnie Garvin versus Jim Cornette. The Midnight Express was with me, but they had nobody to work, so Dusty just booked them and said, go out and do the fucking angle. <clears throat> so we get there that day, and son of a bitch, that fucking card did 69 grand, all, over 6,000 people, $156,000 in today's money. And I made $1,065 for a six-minute cage match, which translates to 2418 today. And it was the scariest and most fun time I've ever had because they, they, Dusty said, let's do the deal. We've got the cage set up. Garvin's in the fucking cage. Here you come, your arms in the sling, the neck brace. I brought all the shit, right? You've got a note from your doctor. You slipped in the fucking shower tray, you know, as you were taking a shower before your match, you slipped in the shower back there and then the commission will not let you wrestle. So Bobby Eaton's going to take your place. And just when the people are ready to burn the fucking building down, here comes the fucking baby faces. And they shoveled us into the God or shoveled me into the goddamn ring and slammed the door and kept the midnight express out. And I shit my pants. Oh God. And I start trying to climb the cage. And the first thing Ronnie does is grab me by the fucking pants pocket and fucking rip my pants off. So as I'm hanging on the side of the cage, so now I'm standing there in my shirt and my tie and my underwear and also and the, my knee braces, which I tried to cover up with sleeves because I didn't want to get any sympathy for them because I had two, uh, at, but no, I had one. I had one knee brace at that point. Didn't have two yet. So I covered that up. I didn't want to get any sympathy. And he fucking roughs me up a couple of times. I take a couple of bumps. I go in, I throw the fucking powder. I blind him. Now I fucking go into my sleeve, covering up my knee brace and I get the knucks and I fucking pickle him in the head. He goes down, he gets juice. Now Ronnie Garvin is blind and bleeding and I've got the chance to hammer him for another minute or so until finally I miss an elbow drop and he starts standing up and Ronnie gets that fucking expression on his face, the wide eyes, and he's going to make his comeback face and he's got blood and he's got powder. I'm like, oh shit. And boom, boom, boom. He bumps me a couple of times. I try to climb the cage again. He jerks me down. He finally, he gets on top of me. He's choking me around the fucking neck with both hands, right? Because like, he's going to kill me. And he's raining the punches on me, and it, they were beautiful. The sight of Ronnie Garvin's face when he is punching down on you, bleeding and fucking powdered and all that stuff, is frightening. But he never fucking potated me once, even though he could have got a receipt. So anyway, finally, boom, he's throttling me, and the referee sees my shoulders down and counts one, two, three. That lets, lets the cage door open, and here comes the midnight in, and we flurry, and we're out of there. And the place went wild and they loved it. And there was no fucking issues whatsoever because that's the way a manager and wrestler match is supposed to go. But I carried that whole fucking thing for once on my back and actually pulled the fucking thing off. I was very proud of that and also that I lived through it. And Dusty heard about that gate and said, I'm never going to book Cornette without me on the same show ever again. No, that was the one back in February of 86 when the Midnight and the Rock and Roll sold out with him and Flair in Toronto. Okay, well, one, one other question about this time period, Jim. Obviously, it's a couple months later against Wyndham and Garvin that you guys win the U.S. Tag Team Title Tournament. When did you find out they were going to do that? They were going to put the secondary tag belts on you guys. And you guys ended up holding them for like a year almost. Yeah, uh, you know, I can't remember. They had a tournament i think at the end of 86 they did something else with the belts then they you know we had this program and ended up getting them there in i think aprilish march or aprilish of 87 and we held them until the fantastics came in because remember that was i think that was the deal is right before the fantastics beat us for them we celebrated our one year anniversary that was where i got a cake in the face again from the fantastics right, our yeah. one year anniversary because Dusty, we had held the world tag title from February until, <clears throat> what was it, August of 86, and then dropped it back to the rock and roll. And then he wanted to go with Rude and Manny as the world tag team champions. But we were getting to be so much bigger, and they were starting to buy the other territories, that he wanted to have a secondary tag team title. And he played with it a little bit and decided when we had it, at one point, he told us, he said, boy, that's your belt. It's part of your ring wardrobe, the robes and the belt, because it it made us look 
like a better package when I could go out and crow that we were champions of something. And he just liked the midnight being some type of champion so I could do those promos. So he said, just consider it part of your ring gear. You're going to have those fucking belts. And like we, then we held them for that year. Then it meant something when we finally turned around and put them on the Fantastics and Cord bringing the Fantastics in. And that program we did was my idea. That's the first one that Dusty really let me go with, where I could call the finishes and the whole nine yards and the way that we set it up and the way that we brought them in and put them over non-title on TV and then did the angle on the clash and then put them over in that match. I didn't obviously didn't ask that we were allowed to go the whole hour. That was Dusty's call because the matches we were having were so good with him. He wanted to showcase it. That's an old Eddie Graham trick. The, you know, the title match goes the whole hour of TV, but to put the belts on him on television with that finish, which was a, a takeoff of an old Lawler and Dundee finish in Memphis where they, T's stopping it, and then the fucking Dundee came back to goddamn do a Hail Mary and win. People went crazy. And then we ended up, I think, beating them back for it at the end so that we could go into some other shit. And then we were still, you know, back and forth with the tag, U.S. tag belts in 89 when Dusty was gone and, and you know, TBS had taken over. But that was kind of our thing at that point because – it gave us something to brag about. It gave, it was, you know, part of our presentation, as they say. Did that answer your question? That answered my question. <laughs> well, speaking of 1988, what, what did you do? Okay. Valentine's Day 88. I remember now because I went back and looked in my book. This was the famous night that we spent at the Airliner Motel. on. Oh, February, my God. Overnight, February 13th <laughs> into 14th. And go back and look at YouTube for that story. I don't know what it's titled, but we had flown from Philly on Crockett's goddamn Gulfstream, the G1. I don't know if you've ever told that story on the show, actually. Yes, I have. I have to have. I don't know. I, I know I did it just last year on one of the shows, the drive through or whatever, but Philly, we had, we had headwinds, and you could almost beat that goddamn prop jet, the G1, that Crockett had first, you could almost beat it with a car on the interstate. So we were flying at like 72 miles an hour, right to Chicago. <clears throat> and we, and cause we had an afternoon show the next day. And so we got in at like three o'clock in the morning. And because we were in so late, they had rerouted us. We thought we all had reservations at O'Hare airport in Chicago. They didn't tell us we were going into fucking love field or not love field. That's Dallas, but, um, got midway in Chicago. Midway Airport, which back then there was nothing there except private planes and cargo and bullshit practically. It's still not the biggest airport in the world, Midway in Chicago, but there's something around it. But 30 years ago, we got in at 3 o'clock in the morning. Nobody had any hotel reservations. This this private aviation facility doesn't have flights coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning. There was literally one guy that swept up running the fucking thing, and they were able to get one cab for 16 guys that could ferry us four at a time back and forth to the closest and only motel that we could find rooms in just to sleep from four o'clock until noon. Right. Um, which turned out to be the airliner motel. And I'm not going to tell that whole story over again, involving the three stooges room that fucking Bobby got with the three different beds broke down and the fucking phantom ghost phone calls and the murders <laughs> at the other rooms and, and the going next door to the white castle where Paul Jones didn't realize they were supposed to taste that way. And all of us being scared for our lives by being checked into the guy to the hotel by the goddamn cast of fucking motel hell and people, the guy working there in a fucking nightshirt and a bathrobe carrying our sheets out to hand us the whole nine yards, but it was me and the midnight and Murdoch. <clears throat> and I will give you the punchline. We all spend sleepless nights in this fucking place, this crack den scared for our lives, getting phone calls from the dead and hearing murders in the next room. And then suddenly the next day we're bright and early. We're at the fucking lobby waiting for Murdoch. So we can get the fuck out of there and get down to the pavilion. And Dickie comes out whistling and happy as Dick, did you get any sleep in this fucking place? He's ah, oh, me and Rhodes checked in a hotel one night. When we woke up the next morning, there was three inches of snow on top of us. Because <laughs> they both hung their head out the window fucking puking and went to sleep that way. But um, So we go to the USC Pavilion. It's a 2 o'clock show. 
And it's the Midnight Express and Dick Murdoch against Ronnie and Jimmy Garvin and Barry Windham. That was one of the uh, feature attraction matches. Hold on. I've lost my bookmark. I'm going to tell you what the main event was that day. February 14, 1988 in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Lex Luger beat Arn Anderson in a cage match. Road Warrior Hawk and Paul Ellering beat the Warlord and Barbarian in a ladder match. Think Animal might have been hurt. Dusty Rhodes beat Larry Zbysko disqualification. Mike Rotunda over Nikita Koloff. Barry, Ronnie, and Jimmy Garvin, or Barry, Ronnie, and Jimmy, Barry Windham, Ronnie, and Jimmy Garvin, Drew, the Midnight Express, and Dick Murdoch. Tully Blanchard beat Ricky Santana, and they were using locals even then. JT the Spider beat Catfish Charlie, I swear to fucking <laughs> Christ. Probably didn't help situation, but that was a $60,000 house, and that's that was after we killed Chicago at Starcade 87 when the Road Warriors didn't get the belts. So we did sixty thousand dollars, six eight weeks or so, eight weeks, nine weeks after we killed the town, for a two o'clock Sunday afternoon show. We made four hundred bucks a piece for that little fifteen minute Broadway. Then we got back on the plane, and went to the Omni in Atlanta that night, where we did a hundred and six thousand dollar house and made seven hundred bucks a piece because that card was that when Oli returned. Hold on. NWA world champion Ric Flair beat Sting. Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson beat Lex Luger and Ole Anderson. Yeah. Road Warrior Hawk and Paul Ellering beat Warlord and Barbarian in a ladder match. The Garvins and Wyndham drew. No, they beat us that night. Beat the Midnight Express and Dick Murdoch. Rotunda over Koloff. Nikita and Ivan Koloff over Ron Simmons. That did 106 grand in the Omni because that was the, the night that Ole came back as a babyface to combat you know, the evil horseman. Uh, but for the day, the point is, this is February 1988. Charlotte, uh, uh, <clears throat> Charlotte uh, Crockett was already in financial difficulties, be not because of the houses per se, but because of the televisions and the territories and the dead spots in the country that he had absorbed over the last year and a half. The core cities were still doing good. The core talent crew was still doing good. For two shows that day, we grossed 170 grand, which is 370 grand in today's money. And for being in preliminary matches on those cards, me and the Midnight made 1,100 bucks each, which is 2,400 bucks for the day in today's money to be in preliminary matches. But because of the Kansas cities and the the old Mid South Territory and Florida. And the constant TV tapings and the the dead weight they had picked up trying to build the wrestling network and getting shut off of pay-per-view with Starcade 87, where they did damage severely Chicago. We'd been on a string of like six, seven sellouts there in that building, $100,000 houses, and then they didn't put the belts on the Warriors. That's been gone over. But it still wasn't dead. You do 60 grand on a two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Is that the but single worst night, though? If you have to really think back to it, the downfall of Crockett Promotions, Starcade 87, where on pay-per-view you blocked out almost every single pay-per-view market by Vince McMahon and the Survivor yep. Series. Because it wasn't just that he yeah. put the Survivor Series on. He was the, telling cable companies, if you air Crockett, you won't get WrestleMania. You won't, yeah, you won't get WrestleMania. You, we will not do business anymore. And they thought, well, fuck, he's the only guy that's done anything you know, like this so far. Are we going to take a chance on the new guys or are we just, just going to stick with this because it's wrestling and they didn't know the fucking difference anyway. And Hogan Andre WrestleMania three was just months before that. And then also in Chicago, the live show, the road warriors. And I will never understand Dusty's logic there. Yeah, this was bad. So, I mean, would you say that night from that double whammy, maybe the single worst night for Crockett promotions during the downfall? Yeah. Well, that was, that was the, that was the turning point. They never recovered from that because it took Turner Broadcasting's intervention to get full cable coverage uh, by the Great American Bash 88, and it took Turner's intervention to give the live Clash of Champions specials to combat WrestleMania, which made the cable companies go to both of them and say, quit this, you're costing us all money. But by then, you know, it, it, and also they gave up a couple of hundred thousand dollars in one night by moving to Chicago from Greensboro and Atlanta because each the previous couple of years 
I mean, Greensboro was going to sell out no matter what because it was Starcade, and that would be three hundred thousand dollars. That's and they, Starcade eighty six had done three hundred in the arena and another sixty grand, close circuiting, you know, to the building next door, and Atlanta was guaranteed three hundred grand for Starcade. So, but they, you know, they. They fucking gave up. Well, they gave up more than fucking Jesus Christ, more than a couple of hundred grand. They gave up several because the house in fucking Chicago sold out was almost a little under 200. So they gave up that money so they could be from a big metropolitan city like Chicago and to come on pay-per-view and then didn't get the fucking. It was on pay-per-view, but no pay-per-view cable companies carried it except for like a half a dozen. So they lost all the pay-per-view money that they thought they were going to get lost several hundred thousand dollars in cash from the gate receipts by running Chicago instead of Greensboro and Atlanta. So yeah, that was the, the tipping point. But as far as live business, as we saw February of 88 was still able to fucking do it in the core cities with the core talent group because Turner Broadcasting hadn't taken complete control yet. So we go from February 14, 1988, where we did two shows grossing a total of 170 grand, 370 of today's money. Guys on the card in preliminary matches making the equivalent of 2,500 bucks just for that day's work. February 14th, 1989, Turner Broadcasting is in full control. It's a Tuesday. We're in Gainesville, Georgia, doing a syndicated TV taping. <laughs> and I made $150. Oh. After six years, I'm back making $150 on Valentine's Day. Exactly the same thing I made in Memphis, but it wasn't even worth as much at that point. Was that George Scott booking already in February? Yes, I, yes, that's when he just started. And of course, we were on the contract guarantees at that point. So when I make, I said we made $150, that's an asterisk. I don't want to do the old poor me. It was always, we always got fucked and everything. Cause we, I was on a $3,000 a week guaranteed contract, but they would pay you for the shows you were on, whatever you earned on that show. And then they'd bonus you the rest of your contract. And nobody at, WCW in those days, not one single talent was making any more than their guaranteed contract. So that's what I mentioned on a show here recently. You knew what you were going to fucking make. There was no incentive. You're going to make the same thing the first match of the main event, whether you won or lost, whether you drew or didn't, whether you had any heat or not. And it just led all the people who really liked what they were doing and wanted to be in the business to be miserable. And all the people who didn't give a shit and just wanted to take the money and were complacent, and do as little work as possible made them happy. So they were the ones that stuck around when all the people who gave a shit started being run off. And, and then the final year of the WCW years, February 14th, 1990, after the previous year, I'm back to making 150 bucks. Like I was when I was on the fucking card in Memphis, even more indicative of the pattern that Turner broadcasting had taken WCW in. That was a day of, that was a Wednesday that year. And we were just fucking off. We didn't make a goddamn thing. We didn't go anywhere. So the 80s, it was from the outhouse to the penthouse and straight back. And then you never ran Valentine's Day during Smoky Mountain? Uh, I looked all for, no, we did not. I think it was a Sunday, a Tuesday, and a Wednesday or whatever, the years that would have been applicable. And we never, we you know, in the summertime, sometimes we'd run weeknights because of the fair shows, but not in the wintertime. And it wasn't a TV taping because we always did that at the first of the month on a Monday. So, yeah, there you go. All right. Well, there you go. Cupid Cupid was kind to me in the middle there. 86, 87, and 88 were great Valentine's Days to make the equivalent equivalent of over 1000 to almost 2500 bucks in one day. And it, But it started at 150 and it finished at 150 I guess that's fitting. <laughs> There's something to be said there. <laughs> My career has come full circle. And remember, folks, the only wrestling-related appearance I'll be doing this year will be for Bobby Fulton on March 14th, so I can get my fifth decade, and then I'm doing another one in 2022, so I can get my 40 years even. And otherwise, if you ever see me around a fucking live, active wrestling match in a ring again, I want you to come up and hit me in the head with a fucking claw hammer. 
because I'm an idiot. You know, I just looked because I was thinking of one, but I realized I was a day off. Sunday Bloody Sunday was February 13th, 1994. 13th, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It could have been the St. Valentine's Day Massacre if it was one day later. We, if, if I'd have had one, we would have had one. If I'd have had a fucking big show on Valentine's Day, you know as well as I do. I think we, yes, we, as a matter of fact, that's one of the OVW shows. We did the St. Valentine's Day massacre when they bought a couple of shows from us down at Coyote's Nightclub downtown in, in Louisville. And we did a St. Valentine's Day massacre, but that wasn't nothing to write home about. Coyote Calhoun? No, just Coyote's Nightclub. <laughs> I know, I know. No, well, no, but people are going to say, well, who the fuck's Coyote Calhoun was the DJ that Lawler worked here in Louisville that d did the biggest house of the modern era for wrestling, um, at least people wise. They didn't raise the prices like they did for the scaffold match. But in 1976, he packed the fucking place out. Coyote Calhoun against Jerry Lawler. Coyote was on wacky radio. He was the six o'clock to 10 o'clock DJ that everybody in town listened to back when you listened to AM radio. And then later on, he went to. WAMZ here and became one of the top country music DJs in the country, won all kinds of country music association awards. But I saw him get dumped on his ass by Jerry Lawler back when. All right. Well, speaking, it of, wasn't his place. <laughs> speaking of taking a dump on your ass. Yeah. Why don't we wind this fucking thing up? I've got to go fill some more fucking Cornette's collectibles orders, folks. Jim .com If you're so inclined, if I ain't blocked you, spend some money with me. You, you deserve these fine products if you've not been blocked by me. And once again, if you were tuning in to listen to the review of AEW or NXT or anything else, this week on the drive through debuting Monday, we will have Jim's thoughts on AEW as well as Monday Night Raw. He's going to see several clips, not the whole episode, and whatever else he tends to watch. between Whatever else, it, when I decide to ruin my good mood that I'm in now. You and, may and like it. You may like it. I may, I may like, well, you, apparently I've missed something on AEW, so I will watch it with an open mind and, and hopefully no other spittle lipped victims will piss me off on Twitter to the point where I'm in a bad mood. And I promise you there are no messiahs or Hanna-Barbera characters on TV this week on AEW. Very good. What they do off air. I can't, I can't uh, explain. You would think when you're under the microscope for doing silly shit, you'd just try to keep the silly shit to a minimum out in public. But that's just me. We, anyway. just, we just want fans to go home happy. We just yeah. want everyone to be happy. Well, most of the fucking money, uh, except in the case of when they d should have pulled the trigger on the Road Wars getting the belts and they didn't, most of the fucking money that was made that I just talked to you about was when the fans went home mad waiting to see somebody get even the next show. There's just a thought. But anyway, there's your thought for the day as we close up, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go honk my horn again and clear some more of this fucking oyster snot out of my sinuses. And we're going to come back with the drive through this coming weekend and the experience again next week and uh, take apart some more things that need deconstructing and people and put them back together again in the right way or like a ransom note, as the case may be. Uh, thank you, Brian, Bo Diddley. Tom Boogaloo Shaft and everybody who contributed to this episode. We will see you next week. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, y'all.